Hello everyone and welcome to The Seven Student. Today we're doing C3.2, which is Defense Against Disease and definitely a favorite of mine. So let's get started. Firstly, a disease causing organism is called a pathogen. Okay, that's the definition of a pathogen. And they're divided into four groups. So bacteria, fungi, protists, and viruses. You've probably heard of bacteria, right? Uh, prokaryotes. Fungi are eukaryotes, for, for example, athlete's foot is a type of fungal pathogen. A, a type of protist is malaria, um, and a type of virus is, for example, COVID, right? So remember, viruses are not living. Okay, so let's talk about how our body protects itself from attack by a pathogen. So our primary defense, and IB seems to be quite keen on you knowing them as primary defenses and secondary defenses, okay? So let that stick in your brain. The primary defense in your body is what's covering you. That is your skin and your mucus. So if you think about it, you have skin covering most of your body and the parts where you don't, you have mucus, such as, for example, um, the airways, uh, the vagina, the head of the penis, etc. So the skin is a tough layer of cells, right? So pathogens cannot pass through. But in addition to that, actually, the skin has a very low pH, which inhibits the growth of bacteria and fungi. Now, in terms of the mucous membranes, they're thinner and they're a softer type of skin. So uh, it's easier for pathogens to get through. That's why they secrete mucus, which is a sticky solution. And that causes pathogens to come, become trapped in it. And then they are expelled. However, what happens when the skin is cut? So this can happen very often, right, uh, throughout our lives. Uh, and we cannot bleed out or get a really serious infection. So what happens is um, we need to clot the blood. We need to close the wound. How does that happen? It's through a cascade of reactions. And this happens really, really fast, okay? Uh, basically, platelets release clotting factors, and that causes the conversion of prothrombin to thrombin. Thrombin in itself causes the uh, conversion of fibrinogen to fibrin. And then fibrin forms this mesh that you can see here, which traps red blood cells inside it and forms a hard scab when it dries. So now, what happens, however, if pathogens manage to get through before clotting and they enter the blood? Well, before that, I want to take 10 seconds to say that all of the slides, including extensive notes for each slide, are now available on my site. And if you want to check it out, you can get a free sample. It'll be in the description below. But now, moving on. The immune system. So the immune system is the secondary defense. It's the next layer. So if pathogens get through the first barrier, this is here to protect us. There's two, the innate immune system and the adaptive immune system. So the innate immune system responds in the same way to all pathogens, okay? So it's not specific and it's constant throughout your lifetime. It doesn't change. Whereas the adaptive is specific to every single pathogen and it builds up memory to the pathogens that it has encountered. So it changes throughout your lifetime. Let's look at the innate first because the innate is the first defense. So the innate is meant to be there as a placeholder until adaptive kicks in because adaptive takes longer to build as we'll see. So what's the key that you need to remember here? The term phagocytes, okay? So phagocytes are the key cells of the innate immune system. They can, as you can see here, engulf pathogens, okay? And then once the pathogen is inside them, uh, they can digest them using enzymes in lysosomes, which remember is a type of organelle. So whenever you get a wound and a pathogen comes through, that attracts large numbers of phagocytes. Um, and actually, when you get pus in a wound, that is dead phagocytes, uh, for those of you who are curious. So what happens if the pathogen manages to breach this as well? So the phagocytes are not enough. Well, then we're going to activate the adaptive. This is the basis of the adaptive. Okay, we're going to look at it in more detail, but the main cells are called lymphocytes. You'll see that lymphocytes divide into B cells and T cells, but right now remember lymphocytes. And lymphocytes produce antibodies. Antibodies destroy pathogens and they're super specific to antigens. Okay, I know there's a lot of terms here. Antigens are molecules which are normally on the surface of the pathogen and are used for recognition. So to distinguish between pathogens and ourselves, because we are going to have antigens as well, but different antigens. So each lymphocyte can only produce one type of antibody, which re reacts to one type of antigen. And that's why this is called adaptive and super, super specific. As you might imagine, there's an immense amount of pathogens that exist. So we need to have a lymphocyte against every single type of pathogen, right? Against every single type of antigen. Therefore, we don't have many against each one, right? So we have very few lymphocytes producing a specific antibody against a specific antigen because there's so many we need to cover. So what happens is when a pathogen enters, we need to activate the one that's specific for that antigen 
and make it replicate to have enough. And that is a slow process. And this is why uh, it takes time. Let's look at it in more detail. So this is how the whole thing works, okay? A phagocyte detects a pathogen on near the skin, for example, and it gets the antigens shown in yellow and puts them on their surface. So that's going to be on the surface of the phagocyte. That then activates a helper T cell, okay? A helper T cell is a type of lymphocyte. Um, once the helper T cell is activated by the antigen on the phagocyte surface, okay, it could then bind to B cells, which have the antigen on it as well, and activate the B cells. Now, these B cells, okay, are the ones that produce antibodies. So once they're activated, they're going to repl replicate super, super rapidly via mitosis, and then they're going to start producing antibodies in large numbers, right, which will kill the pathogen. Interestingly, some of them, okay, so some of these B cells, instead of becoming plasma cells, they become memory cells. Why? Because plasma cells fade eventually. So we create some memory B cells that will stay silent until the same pathogen infects again, in which case they respond super rapidly. And that's what's called immunity, right? Which is the ability to eliminate a disease from the body. Good. So that's the basis of immunity. Let's look at some examples. Okay, so HIV, uh, you've all heard about it, is a virus which causes AIDS or Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. How is it transmitted? Well, through body fluids, right? So things like, a, like sex without a condom, sharing of needles by drug users, transfusion of infected blood, and childbirth, actually. So what does HIV do? As you know, viruses enter cells, right? So HIV enters T cells specifically, these helper T cells, and destroys them. This has a really big impact because remember, helper T cells are vital to activate B cells, which produce antibodies. So if you don't have helper T cells, you're not going to have B cells producing antibodies either. And this makes opportunistic infections very common. Now, what is that? Opportunistic infections are infections by pathogens that would normally be fought off really easily, but now because our immune system is deficient, right, we cannot fight them as well. So AIDS is actually the combination of all of the conditions caused by HIV. Although there are some drugs, uh, this disease still has a lot of impact on the people who have it. So now let's look at antibiotics. So antibiotics are drugs, okay? And very, very important, please, they inhibit the growth of bacteria, so prokaryotes, okay? That is it. How come? Okay, a lot of people think that they actually also affect viruses. They don't. Why? Viruses are non-living, okay? What antibiotics do is they target processes that only happen in prokaryotes. Why? Because if they targeted processes that happened in eukaryotes, they would kill us, right? Uh, so for example, what they do is they target things like bacterial DNA replication or cell wall formation, because those things are different in bacteria and in our cells. Viruses use our machinery, right? They use our cells. So if you targeted these processes, again, you would kill us. So you need to know that bacteria are evolving resistance to antibiotics. Um, and that's easy because bacteria pass on genes between each other. But it's very dangerous because it could lead to routine surgeries being um, quite, quite um, risky, right? Because you might get a, an infection. So to avoid this, right, to avoid the emergence of resistance, doctors should only prescribe them for serious infections. Also, farmers should stop using antibiotics as growth stimulants, which is done currently. And also pharmaceutical companies should develop more since there's no new type since the 80s. So those are three important things to remember, okay? Another important thing, so noses. So pathogens, okay, are normally quite specialized to infect one type of organism. So a pathogen that infects humans is very unlikely to infect, um, for example, frogs, right? But some pathogens can infect many species. And a zoonosis is a disease that can be transmitted to humans from other animals. For example, COVID, right? It's thought that it came from bats. Other examples are tuberculosis, which can also infect cattle, rabies, which mostly infects dogs, right? And Japanese encephalitis virus, which infects pigs and birds as well. So, uh, actually, most diseases that are thought to emerge as of late are zoonosis. So this is something that's being paid a lot of attention to as the next big virus or bacteria might come from an animal. Okay. Vaccinations. I hope everyone understands the concept here. So vaccines, basically what they do is they trigger immunity to a specific pathogen. So they trigger the adaptive system. They cause uh, the adaptive system to generate memory B cells. And those memory B cells last a really long time. So if you have a second encounter with the antigen then uh, your memory B cells are going to kick in super quickly and create a response much, much quicker than the first time. Here, you also have to understand the concept of herd immunity. So herd immunity is achieved when a sufficient proportion of the population is immune to the disease through vaccination or infection, right? You can become immune by being infected. 
This means that outbreaks of the disease okay, decline and disappear since it can't transmit properly. So not everyone in the population needs to be vaccinated for herd immunity to be achieved just enough. Okay. And then in terms of vaccines, also importantly, uh, they can be made in different ways. So they can be made uh, just, they can be an antigen. They can be nucleic acid, acids with the sequence for the antigen. And then our cells basically translate that nucleic acid. They can be the pathogen alive, but attenuated, or the pathogen that's been killed. So remember those methods of making vaccines. And finally, you need to know these formulas. Uh, I'm not going to spend much time on them. I think they're quite straightforward, but they're in the syllabus in this topic. So I just wanted to make sure that everyone has a quick recap with this. Okay, so heading on to questions. Uh, actually, some of you uh, suggested that I add more questions here because you found them really useful. So I've, had, I've added five this time. So let's go through them. Which of the following correctly matches the immune cell to its primary function? As always, you can pause here and I'll count down to three. So three, two, and one. Memory B cells produce antibodies upon secondary exposure, right? Plasma cells produce antibodies, not engulf pathogens. Helper T cells uh, do not kill infected cells. They just help B cells activate. And phagocytes engulf pathogens. Okay. Next one. Which statement correctly distinguishes innate immunity from adaptive immunity? So, again, three, two, and one. C. Okay. So, remember, innate is the same for all pathogens. It's really quick. It's not specific. Um, however, adaptive is much slower because it is specific, right? So there is production of memory B cells and adaptive, so that's completely wrong. A, uh, the response does not improve upon repeated exposure for innate. It's the same always, as I said, so A is not it. And also innate doesn't produce antibodies, right? So D is incorrect. Okay. Next one. Which statement best describes herd immunity? Okay. Three, two, and one. I just mentioned this, right? So, uh, it's an immunity that protects individuals who are not immune due to a large proportion of immune individuals in the population. Um, remember, this doesn't have to be 100%. Uh, it just has to be a number large enough. And that depends on the virus and also the population. Fourth question. Why are antibiotics ineffective against viral infections? Same thing. Three, two, and one. Remember, viruses are not targeted because they do not have the same mechanisms as prokaryotes, right? Antibiotics do enter human cells. They can enter human cells, right? It's just that they don't target processes that happen in human cells, right? Because that would be really dangerous. It would kill us instead of the bacteria. So we're just targeting things that happen in bacteria only, and viruses do not have those processes, all right? And final question, which best explains why HIV infection leads to an increased risk of opportunistic infections? So three, two, and one. Recall HIV infects helper T cells, right? Uh, which then cannot activate B cells, so antibodies are not produced. They don't infect any of the other cells. So that's a wrap. I hope this was clear. I think it's a semi-intuitive topic. Any questions, as always, in the comments, and I'll see you next week for the next topic. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye.